and hello Facebook. Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. Okay? <clears throat> and as you know, I am on every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, uh, which is right now. 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time every Sunday, and I'm also on the uh, second Thursday of every month, which is this Thursday coming up at 7 o'clock p.m., uh, continuing my series entitled No More Genies. And when I talk about No More Genies, I'm talking about getting rid of our genie concept of God and getting into a scriptural concept of God so we can believe and say right things. Now, if you're coming on, please like and share these videos, because whenever God releases a prophetic word, it's designed to go worldwide because other people will be blessed by it and other people can get the encouragement and the edification and hear from the Lord. So please like and share this video as you come on. <clears throat> All right, now, uh, well, let's have a word of prayer first and then we'll dive into today's prophetic word. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence by faith. Thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ. I ask, oh God, that you speak to me, God. I surrender. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. Speak to my mind, my hand movements, my eyes, my lips, everything I have, oh God. I surrender to you so that your spirit can breathe through me, that you might be glorified and that the saints might be edified and the demons might be terrified as your mighty word comes forth. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right. Let's dump, jump right in. <clears throat> Today's prophetic word is maintain course. One more time. Today's prophetic word is maintain course. A scripture reference is we're going to look at 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19. Now, if you don't, that's in the New Testament. If you're not sure who Timothy is, he's a uh, protege of Paul in a lot of ways. Timothy is a young pastor and he's a pastor in a church that the apostle Paul established. And so Apostle Paul writes First and Second Timothy as letters of instruction and encouragement to help him establish his pastorate, to help continue to establish the church, to answer doctrinal questions, because that's what apostles do, and that's what the apostolic anointing is for, to lay foundation, to answer questions, to get you a solid foundation in your faith. But then God brings in pastors to help shepherd you so you can grow up into Christ. Okay? That's who Timothy is, just, you know, very briefly. That's who Timothy is, and that's why Paul has written First and Second Timothy. He's writing these letters to his young protege, to this young pastor, to do all the things I said. Okay? So our prophetic word today from the Holy Ghost is maintain course. So we're going to read First uh, Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Here we go. I'm reading out of the Berean Study Bible. Timothy, my child, I entrust you with this command in keeping with the previous prophecies about you so that by them you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience, conscience which some have rejected and thereby shipwrecked their faith. Oh my goodness. Those verses are action-packed. Let's go back up to verse 18. Timothy, my child, so obviously they're close. I entrust you, okay? Now, coming out of the Hebrew, that word entrust, it means by implication to deposit. It means I place alongside, I present to you, but I deposit in you. So Apostle Paul is giving Timothy here a vote of confidence that I'm entrusting you with uh, this command, okay? That means that Paul is saying that I believe in you, Okay? And that is the same thing that God says to us in Christ, that he believes in us because love believes all things. I have discovered that a lot of saints believe in God, but they don't believe in themselves. And a lot of saints uh, say they believe in the love of God, but they don't love themselves. Okay? But God believes in you. Did you know that? That might be the first time in your life you ever heard somebody say that to you, that God actually believes in you. But he does. He thinks good things about you. He has good plans for your future. He knows that you can overcome your enemies and he knows that you can complete your assignment because he's opening his hand and giving you the grace to do so. 
God believes in you. Okay? Maybe nobody ever told you that. Maybe you've been around a bunch of old, mean, religious people, and God help you if that was the case, because your whole concept of God is wrong if old, mean, religious people are your only source of information. But Paul is saying to Timothy that I entrust you with this command, uh, this deposit, I'm making this deposit in you. I'm presenting this to you in keeping with the previous prophecies about you. Ah, now that's very important. Do you know what that means? <clears throat> That's why, because like in my church, what we do is when there's a personal prophetic word, normally we have people record it. Because what Paul is saying here is that the prophetic word has already been spoken about Timothy. And whenever you get a prophetic word from the Lord about you, <clears throat> excuse me, it's gold. Now, you do obviously need to be listening to a trusted, proven prophet, someone that you know speaks by the Spirit of God. And someone that has a track record of being accurate. But if that's where the prophetic word is coming forth, and the Lord says something about you, then it's gold. You can write it down. It's who you are. It's a part of your life. It's going to come to pass. And once again, once again, that prophetic word is a way of God saying that he believes in you. He said that to Peter. He, Peter was wishy-washy. Peter was unstable. Peter had, a hot, Peter had a hot head and a quick temper. And Peter was impulsive. He was quick to jump and not think. He jumped first and think later. And the Lord said that, Peter, you're a rock. What was the Lord doing? He was speaking prophetically. The Lord said to Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. The Lord just told Peter everything he was going to go through about denying Christ, about running away, going back to try to just being a fisherman. Uh, Jesus was going to come get him and restore him. And the Lord said, after we get through all that, I want you to turn around and bless others. So the Lord was saying, Peter, I believe in you. Even though I know you're going to fall, even though I know you're going to stumble, I'm going to restore you and bring you back. And then I want you to go forward and help other people. Because the Lord believes in us. So Paul is saying to Timothy here that there are some previous prophecies. I want you to think about the prophetic words that have been spoken over your life. Those aren't just words. They're not human words. They're words that are inspired by the spirit of the living God. And I want you to remember that God is outside of time. That means when the Lord speaks a prophetic word over you, it's already happened as far as he's concerned. You have to get out of linear thinking because you cannot think about God like you think about man. We experience life in two 12-hour cycles. And because we experience life in two 12-hour cycles as the earth rotates around the sun, we think that's the nature of life. That's not true. The nature of reality is whatever God says. And God is outside of time. What that means literally is that God is in 2020 right now. God has lived January through December 2020 already. God is in 2034 if the earth remains. God is in 3501 if the earth remains. God is in 4525 if the earth remains. God is there right now. God has already lived through all of next year. Did you know that? January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December of 2020 has already been lived by God. So when God gives you a prophetic word and says, in March of 2020, this is going to happen, you know why the Lord says that? Because he was already there. <laughs> I know you can't, you can't fit that in your mind. You can't fit God in your mind. You're going to have to get out of your sensory information and walk by faith, just like God told you. Because, because the Lord has already lived all the way through to the end. That's why he could give Apostle John the book of Revelation. Because God is outside of time. So when God says a prophetic word about you, he's looking at it. It's already happened. It's already done. And he wants you to walk in it with that same kind of confidence. So that's why Paul here says the previous prophecies about you. Don't throw those away. Don't despise those. Don't think that they don't mean anything. And Paul is saying, I believe in you because the prophetic word has already been spoken over you. And then he goes on to say, so that by them, them what? The previous prophecies, you may fight the good fight. So in other words, Paul is saying, if God told you you're going to win this fight and you're standing in front of a giant that's three times your size, but the prophetic word went forth and God told you you're going to win, 
then Paul says, fight the fight. Fight the good fight because you're going to win. may look bad. You might get knocked down. You might get bloodied and bruised. But if God already said before you went out there that you were going to win, then you're going to win. And if God has already pronounced certain blessings, God has already said certain things over your life, then they are going to come to pass. They have already come to pass from God's point of view. They just haven't happened in linear time yet. So to get there, you've got to fight. Fight your giants. Fight your flesh. Fight the demons. Fight wicked people. Fight institutionalized wickedness. Fight whatever you've got to fight. But you are not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory if God has already given you a prophetic word. That's the power of the prophetic. So Apostle Paul is saying here that he wants Timothy to go ahead on and fight that good fight. Because the prophetic word has already gone forth over you that you're going to win. And God is saying, I believe in you. Okay? But here, verse 19, here's where it gets even deeper. Holding on, verse 19, 1 Timothy 1.19, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Stop. First of all, the Bible says holding on. Do you understand what that means? That means if the Bible says holding on, that means you literally have to hold on to your faith. That means you can let it go if you choose to. You have already seen people do that. You have already seen people that come to church Three times a year, seeing me is Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. Or they come to church half a year, or they give tithes and offerings one time. And then they thought a million dollars was supposed to rain out the sky. And if that didn't happen, then they said, oh, well, that giving stuff don't work. And they gave up. Okay? Because they let go of their faith. Faith doesn't work that way. Faith works like seed time and harvest. Like you hear the word, you believe the word. You feed on the word. You speak it. You sow. You have some works of your faith. And you keep going till you get a harvest. Okay, And even when you see instant miracles, even when you see things turn around like that, that's after years and years and years and years and years of building your faith to where you can get an instant miracle. Okay, It's not magic. Okay, So the Bible says holding on to faith. So that means you could let it go if you want to. You could let it go. You could just say, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to serve God anymore. I don't want to tithe an offer. I don't want to believe God. You could just... Throw your hands up and walk away. Did you know that? Did you know that God is, does not force people to serve him? Do you know that you have free will and free choice? And if you've been hanging around a bunch of mean or religious people, once again, God help you. <laughs> because they've given you the wrong idea. Because God is love and God loves you. And God opens his hand and gives you a choice. And if you don't want to stay with faith, you don't have to. A lot of people do that. Haven't you ever seen people that were going to church just fine, serving God just fine, and then they got in a relationship. And all of a sudden, they started changing. And all of a sudden, they stopped coming to church as much. And all of a sudden, the next time you saw them, their whole lives were upside down, and they became a different person. Do you know why? Because they let go of their faith. They said, this, this living for God stuff, I want to fornicate. I don't want to live holy, so later for that. They said, well... Maybe I'll get a husband and wife someday, but for right now, I want this one, and I don't care if this one is the one. Haven't you ever seen that happen? You know why they did that? Because they let go of their faith. They stopped believing God. They just let it go. So the Bible says you've got to hold on to your faith. That is a conscience, conscious choice that you make to keep on believing God. Okay? Then it says holding on to faith and what is and, y'all? And is a conjunctive word. It's a conjunction. It means that whatever went before it is connected to what's coming after. Holding on to faith and a good conscience. What does that mean? That means that you're not living a shady life as a Christian. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> it means that you're not living a shady life. You're not living a life that you are secretly ashamed of which is one of the easiest things in the world to do, be a Christian in public, but do something else on the private, on the low, on the... The public you is the same as a private you, to where the face that you have in front of people is the same face you have uh, 
uh, in your private life. I tell people all the time, the me that you meet is actually me. And all of my close friends will tell you, the me that you meet is me. I'm that way all the time. I'm not like a different person in different contexts. I'm always me. The person, when you meet me, that's me that you're meeting. Not my representative, not some facade, not some whatever. That's not me. Okay? And my close friends will tell you that. All of, my, all of the people closest to me in my life would describe me exactly the same way. They might come at it from different angles, but they would all say the same basic, basic set of things. Because if they know me, I'm always me. See what I mean? But the Bible says you got to hold on to that good conscience. So in other words, you have to not allow habits that are not from God and not good for you to creep into your life. And then they start weighing you down with guilt. Because ain't nothing worse than coming to the house of God and you know you ain't been living right, right during the week. You know you're shacking up. You're living with somebody you're not married to. Them. That's acceptable to the world. That's not okay in God's kingdom. You know that you got paid, but you haven't paid your tithes and your offerings. You haven't given God his due. You know that you go to church for certain people, but you've been slandering them all week. You smile in their face, but in your heart you know you hate them. Well, when you are living a life and your conscience isn't clear, it can really mess with your faith. It can, the devil can really use it to bog you down with guilt. Because if you don't really believe that there's some reward in the future, that's what makes people let go. That's what makes people say, well, how I live doesn't matter. That's not true. But you have to believe that you, you're going to fight the good fight and win. That's what will make you hold on to your faith and hold on to a good conscience. And that's why you see so many Christians look like they have dichotomous lives. They look like they have one life that they live in church and then Monday through Saturday, if you catch them at Walmart or you catch them at the gas station, it's like they're different people. That means we don't really believe. We don't really be believe that living for God is worth it and that he's going to reward us for obeying him. You got to actually believe. Then he says, which some have rejected and thereby shipwrecked their faith. Oh my goodness. Now coming out of the Hebrew, that word shipwreck means just exactly what it sounds. Literally or figurative, figuratively, a wrecked ship, a shipwreck. What does that mean in practical terms? It says that which some have rejected. Some have rejected what? Some have rejected the idea of holding on to their faith. And some have rejected the idea of living with a good, clean conscience. Because you really need that to live a Christian life. You really need to, to be as honest as you can in your business practices. You definitely need to be faithful in your marriage. You need to be faithful to your church ministries. You need to be the person you're claiming to be. Okay? But some believers reject that and thereby shipwreck their faith. I want you to imagine being out on the ocean, and I want you to imagine being in a race, and everybody's got a boat, and you're in your boat, you and your boat partner, so there's two of y'all in a boat, and one of y'all is working with the motor, or setting a sail, and somebody else is steering, but y'all working together, and you're trying, to, uh, to win, uh, you're trying to win this race, and you're cutting through the water together, and over to the right, you see a boat that is capsized, and over to the left, you see a boat that is run up on some rocks and it broke apart because it hit them rocks so hard that the boat shattered and splintered when it hit the rocks. That's what that's talking about. That there are some Christians, even though they started out in the race, they're going to end up shipwrecked because they won't hold on to their faith and they won't hold on to a good conscience. So that's going to take them off course and they're going to capsize. And that's going to take them off course and they're going to run up on a bunch of rocks. And then your faith gets shipwrecked. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, it can mean a lot of things. You can lose your testimony. You can lose your position. You can do like Esau and sell your birthright. You can have been lined up for something since birth, but because you didn't believe God was ever going to do it, or because it didn't happen the way you wanted it to happen, or it didn't happen when you think it was supposed to happen. Like, for example... Maybe you got, uh, got a prophetic word as a child and you thought that prophetic word was going to happen by the age of 35. 
but it didn't happen for you until you were 55. That means in them, in them 20 years in between, it didn't go like you thought it was going to go. You still have to believe God, that God is still going to come through and do what he said he was going to do, even though it didn't happen in the time frame you thought it was going to happen in. But if you let go of that, you're going to shipwreck. And many times in church, they don't even teach Christians that you can shipwreck. They give you this, this false idea that everything's just going to happen. Uh, that is me. Explain that to me, honey. You said that is me. Explain that to me. They give you this false idea that everything's just going to happen uh, by the perfect will of God, that God's just going to do what he wants, and everything's going to work out, and blah, 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 blah. And that's not the truth. That's genie concept. That's a magic concept, as if God is a genie. This is not magic, and God is not a genie. You have a choice. So if God gives you prophetic words and the will of God leads you somewhere and you have challenges that you have to overcome, you have to believe God and overcome them to get to the next level, to get the prize, to get the reward. As the scripture said, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek them. I had a prophecy I wrote down, I believe it was from God last week on 7th of November. It never happened. Well, maybe it hasn't happened yet, or maybe it didn't happen in a way that, and I felt to give up, right? Well, I want to encourage you that maybe it hasn't happened yet, or maybe it happened and you just haven't seen it. If somebody gives you a prophetic word, uh, it may have happened in the time frame that they said, but it hasn't come across in your eyes yet. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, okay? But I do want to encourage you not to give up your faith, because if it was a prophetic word from the Lord, it will come to pass, okay? But that's what I mean, and so, and so they don't even teach Christians that you can shipwreck. But we can. We can make mistakes. We can take wrong turns. We can do a whole bunch of things and throw ourselves totally off course. And some people never recover. Esau never recovered. Esau never got his birthright back. And Bishop T.D. Jake says that Esau spent the rest of his life trying to get that birthright back. But Esau lost his place in history. God would have been calling himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But Esau sold his birthright to his brother Jacob and lost his place. And it became the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Somebody else in the Bible that lost their place was King Saul, the first king of Israel. Okay, King David was not the first king. King David was the second king. The first king of Israel was a king that they chose, and his name was Saul. And Samuel already told him, Saul, he's not a good person. He's not a good king. But they picked him anyway because he was tall and he looked good. That sounds like us. King Saul got so wishy-washy with God. King Saul was so double-minded with God, he wanted a little bit of God and a little bit of Saul, and a little bit of spirit and a little bit of flesh, and a little bit of what God say and a little bit of what the people say, and a little bit of faith and a little bit of what looked good. He got so double-minded with God that God cursed King Saul with schizophrenia, and then he ripped the kingdom, he tore the kingdom from King Saul and gave it to David. And let Saul live long enough to watch David rise to power. And then everybody except one son in Saul's family died. That son was Mephibosheth. He was the only one that did not. And he was crippled from birth. Everybody else that was a part of King Saul's family died because God tore the kingdom from Saul and gave it to King David. Shipwreck. Okay? Somebody else in the Bible is a Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot had, see, I keep, oh. You hear me say it all the time. When the Son of God turned himself into Jesus Christ, when the Son of God came through the womb of a woman and got wrapped in human flesh and became a man, that was not once in a lifetime experience. That was not a once in a generation experience. Like uh, Michael Jordan, you know, I'm glad I got to see Jordan in his heyday. There will be other great basketball players. I'm glad I got to see a whole Michael Jackson. I'm glad I, I got to see all those people in their day. But there will be other great entertainers, that will, uh, President Obama. There will be other great politicians, and there will be other great athletes. But when God became a man, that was not once in a lifetime. That was not once in a generation. That was once in all creation. In all of time and space, God only turned himself into a man and came through the womb of a woman exactly one time. And when the Lord resurrected from the grave, ascended back to heaven, he doesn't have to die anymore. He doesn't have to go through all that again. That was one time. That will never happen again. 
in, in a million years of eternal living, God will never incarnate himself and come through the womb of a woman again. That happened one time. And so Jesus told, chose 12 men and about half a dozen women because there were about six women that followed the Lord and supported the Lord with their resources. But he chose 12 men as disciples and apostles. And Judas Iscariot was among the 12. You got to be one of the people that got to be close to God when he was a man. Because he put himself in human form so you could look in his face and not die. Because if we beheld God's face as God, we, we couldn't stand there. We'd die. He put himself in a human form. You could hear his voice audibly. You could look him in the face. You could feel his hands on you. You could touch him. And Judas got the opportunity to be one of the 12 men that walked and talked with Jesus personally. And what did Judas do? He sold the Lord out. He sold Jesus Christ out for 30 pieces of silver to, well, it was really to the Jewish leaders because they couldn't kill Jesus but they accused him of treason and then turned him over to the Roman government who said, we have no king but Caesar, and this man says he's a king. That's why they arrested Jesus. That's why the Romans arrested Jesus, because the Jews wanted to kill him, but they didn't have a cross penalty, and they you know, weren't really in power. The Roman government was in power. So they accused Jesus of treason, and they said, which, one is, which rabbi is this Jesus you're talking about? And Judas said, well, I'll kiss him, and the one that I kiss, that's the one. He sold the Lord out into the hands of the Roman soldiers, and the Lord got arrested, beaten, whipped, stabbed, pierced, and then crucified because Judas sold him out. Now, obviously there was already a plan of God, but Judas is the one that sold him out. And there's two different stories about how Judas ends in the Bible. One story says that Judas hung himself, and another story says that Judas, uh, basically his stomach exploded, and his guts uh, spilled out in a field, and that's why they call it a field of blood. So maybe both could have happened. Maybe he got a stomach wound, and then he hung himself. I don't know, but there's actually two different accounts in Scripture of what ends up happening to Judas. But the point that I'm trying to make is that he had a chance to walk with Jesus, and that was only going to happen one time in all of creation. He had a chance to look God right in the face when God was a man. When we know the Lord now, we know him through the Spirit. But they got to know him both through the Spirit and in the flesh. That's why Apostle John in the Bible always talks about that which our eyes have seen, that which our hands have handled of the word of life. That's why I love John's book so much, because they're personal. He said, I knew Jesus. I saw him. I heard his voice. I talked to him. I was there when he died, because Apostle John was there when he died. When the Lord was on the cross, there were two people at the foot of the cross. Apostle John, his best friend, and Mary, his mom. So they knew Jesus personally, man. They were looking right at him. And Judas had a chance to be a part of that company. And he sold the Lord out. He blew it. And became the betrayer of the body and the blood of Christ. See, something inside me just trembled every time I say that. Can you imagine standing before Father God in judgment and you're the one that sold Jesus into the hands of the Roman soldiers? You're the one that caused him to put the nails in his hands? That's because of you shipwreck. So those are three examples I want to give you from the scripture. Esau, King Saul, and Judas Iscariot, of all people that had a chance to follow God, to serve God, to love God, to know God, and they blew it because they did not hold on to their faith and they did not hold on to a good conscience. So what's that got to do with us today? I'm glad you asked me. The Holy Spirit told me to say, he wants to encourage us to maintain course. Some of you looking at me right now, you've come a long way. I know I have. If I told y'all my whole story, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. You would not believe me if I told you my story. But some of y'all looking, looking at me right now, you have come a long way. God has brought you through much, much trials, many trials, much tribulation, much pain, much fire, much water. But you made it. You made it to 2019, you made it to the promised land, you're living your dream, you're moving forward, you're growing in your faith, and God is using you to make a difference. Now, the Holy Spirit wants to say to you to maintain course. Now, that means there might be some rough waters ahead, but also what people rarely talk about is the temptation of still waters. Did you know that still waters sometimes are harder than rough waters? 
Because at least, at least when rough waters are going, at least you got something to fight. You got something to do. When still waters are going, you know what can happen? Sometimes you can get bored. Sometimes you can start to take life or God for granted. It, it takes more discipline to be faithful when things are good. Because normally when things are bad, we come running in church because we need help. If things are good, you have to have more discipline, not less. So the Holy Spirit is saying no matter what the days ahead bring, whether it's rough water or still water, whether it's a huge harvest or more, more sowing, or you might have to be patient, whatever, don't you know that it takes more discipline and commitment to God to serve God when things are well? Did you know that? If you don't have no money, you're holding on to God with all you got because you got to pray in every meal. You got to pray in every ride. You got to pray in every job. That's one thing. What if God dropped, you know, uh, an enormous amount of money on you tomorrow? Would you pray with the same fervor? Would you love God the same? Would you hold on to him the same? See, so it takes more faith and discipline. And again, that good conscience, living right, to, to, to serve God when you're blessed. So the Holy Spirit says, maintain course. That Because everybody's path is individual. But that means whatever's coming up next in your life, the Holy Spirit is saying, stay on course. Don't get shipwrecked. Don't throw away your faith and don't throw away your good conscience. Some of y'all have been waiting for a long time for a spouse. One of the tricks that the devil likes to do, and look for this in your life, by the way. One of the things that the devil loves to do is wait until you get into the last leg of your journey and then throw some trouble, throw a monkey wrench. And right before God's about to graduate you into a relationship, the devil will almost always send the wrong relationship. So if come someone, somebody comes in your life and they're not right, and they just seem to be insistent. They're just pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing to try to get in your life. That's a devil. That's a devil trying to throw you off track because you're about to meet the person you've been praying for. You're about to meet the one that you've been waiting for. You're about to meet the person God has been preparing you for for all these years. And here come the devil with this person to try to throw you off track. That's the kind of thing that the Holy Spirit is saying. we got to maintain course. Excuse me. We can't allow the devil to pull us into being shipwrecked by throwing away our faith or throwing away our conscience. Or some of y'all might have been sowing like since last year. And you've been giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. And you might be tempted to say, you know, this tithe and this offering thing, man, I've been giving and giving and giving. And where's my harvest? You're about to come in to that harvest. And right before you do, the devil is, is, is uh, commonly known. To, to try to give you a shortcut right before you get to the end or try to get you something to pull you off right before you get to the end. That's very, very common. I want you to notice that if you've ever graduated school, I want you to notice how hard that last year was, especially that last semester. Think about it. Either the people around you went crazy or you're so tired of school, you was just dragging, white knuckling to the end. But it's right before you get to the end of completing a course just like running a marathon, that it, it seems to get really, really hard. And so the Holy Spirit is saying that in the days to come, no matter what is going on in your life, if, you know, if there's more fights or if things are super good and you you chilling, you good. He says, maintain course. Stay faithful to God. Stay faithful to the house of God. Stay faithful to your tithing. Stay faithful to letting God use you. Don't give up your faith and don't compromise your good conscience. Don't say, I've been living celibate for seven years, and I'm tired of living celibate, so let me just go ahead on and move in with my boyfriend and move in with my girlfriend. That's not what the Lord wants you to do. If you've been celibate all this time, God wants you to wait until you get with the person that he has for you, then get married, then you live together as husband and wife. That's the way to do it. If you've been tithing and offering all this time, God wants you to maintain your level of tithes and offerings, or maybe even increase, and in due season, that harvest is going to come. Because it has to. Because you cannot sow and not reap. That is not possible, especially in the God's kingdom. Because the word says, if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. That means it has to happen. But we have to hold on to our faith and our good conscience so that we don't get shipwrecked. And so the Holy Spirit is telling us to maintain course. Now, those of you that watch me every week and those of you that walk in the prophetic, you know that the Lord's word is progressive. 
that the Lord, like the good shepherd, is leading us. Think back to the summer. Think back to all the prophetic words this summer. The Lord is leading us step by step, word by word, situation by situation. You see what I mean? And so the Lord is saying now we're about to go into 2020. And not just the year 2020, but it's our 2020 season. That that the year 2020 represents a lot of things, but one of the things 2020 represents is good vision. It's in fact perfect vision. Think about it. When a doctor checks your eyes, if everything's good, what does he say? He says you have 2020. The year 2020 represents the year of clear and perfect vision. That means you're going to know who you are, you're going to know what you're supposed to be doing, and you're not going to be wasting any time in any place else, if you've been following along with the Lord all along. <laughs> but if you're in obedience to Jesus, then you're not going to be wasting time going in all these other places. You're going to be on point. You see what I mean? So the Holy Spirit is saying, maintain that. Don't let anybody take it from you. God said to me, he's removing the blindfold. Amen and amen. So don't let anybody take it from you. Removing the blindfold on my eyes, amen. Don't let anybody take that from you. You see what I mean? And in due season, because now I, I'm a creative professional. What that means is that I create stuff for a living. I write books, I write plays, I write music. Okay, I write children's books, I write comics books. <clears throat> By the time you have something in here, it takes some time to get it out here. <laughs> When God drops the idea in your spirit and you get the idea and it flashes across your mind and you're using your imagination to see that thing on the inside, it's going to take some work to get it out here on the outside, okay? And the Holy Spirit is saying, now that's just what I do, but whatever it is that you do, the Holy Spirit is saying, stay with it. Stay with it. If you've always wanted to have a baby, you can't have a baby without the gestation process. You've got to do your nine months. You can't, hey... After the eighth beat, hey, you can't you can't just go from I want to have a baby to I'm going into labor tomorrow. If you want to have a baby, you got to pay your nine months dues, and then when it's time for the baby to come out, the baby's gonna come out, and you can't stop it. But the point that I'm trying to make is that you've got to hold on to the end to get the baby in your hand. You see what I mean? That's what the Holy Spirit is saying to us is that you're gonna have to go through that tunnel, but at the end you're gonna give birth to that thing that God has put inside of you. So maintain course. Amen and amen. All right, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen now. And I'll pray for what you put on the screen. When you see me close my eyes and speaking in tongues, what I'm doing is I'm asking the Holy Spirit if there's any more financial words, any demons that need to be cast out, any physical healing, and any more general prophetic words he wants me to release. So when you see me close my eyes and pray in tongues, that's what I'm doing. Okay? So if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen right now. All right, this word is for somebody out there named Martha. Martha, the Lord wants you to know that he sees you and he knows you and don't be afraid. Fear not and don't give up, but keep fighting because the Lord is with you and he's going to give you the victory. This prophetic word is for somebody named Caroline. God is saying you're going to be able to have a baby. Don't be afraid. Whatever kind of miscarriages or abortions or whatever might have happened in the past, God is going to give you a child. God is going to give you a child, Caroline. That prophetic word is for you. All right. I think that's it. All right. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm so excited. I, I'm blessed by the prophetic word. Um, when the spirit of God gives it to me, I'm taking it. I'm holding on to it. Like I tell you all the time, there's nothing I'm preaching and teaching and prophesying that I'm not living myself. So I'm excited about the Holy Spirit saying maintain course. That means whatever comes up next, we got to stay faithful to God and we'll get our harvest. We'll get there. Okay. And those of you that are already in the promised land, you're living your dream. God's going to give us more as we stay faithful, as we work, as we continue to stay faithful to what God is saying, as we continue to HBO, hear, believe, and obey. God is going to give us harvest and increase. All right? All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to catch us on the replay, it's on Facebook Live. It's on Periscope. It's on my Twitter feed, which is P 
PDT, SOTC, Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross. That's my band. And then it's also going to be on YouTube in less than an hour. Okay? So if you need to, go back for, to, uh, to this video from the top. We watch it from the top so you can take some good notes so you can hear the word over and over again so you can get it in your spirit and so you can look at the scripture for yourself. Okay? All right. God bless you. Remember all this week to maintain course. And I will see you Thursday night at 7 p.m. for my next installment of No More Genies. And then I'll see you next Sunday for my next installment of my weekly live prophetic word. And then the Tuesday after that is my birthday. Amen and amen. All right. God bless you. Have a good week. Bye-bye.